feel the power of music as it captivates and connects us. Music is love. Music is passion. Music belongs to everyone. This is Minnesota Orchestra. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so whenever I'm ready. Okay. Anxiety feels like being completely trapped and kind of having no way out. You don't really know how to get better sometimes. When I feel anxious, I feel very heavy and it feels a little suffocating. Well, it's it, time kind of like slows down, but it also feels like it speeds up a little bit and it's a very disorienting feeling. So that's how it feels when I am anxious. Anxiety to me feels like there's a brick that's on my stomach and chest and it just makes me want to sit there and go to bed and not ever get out. Everything is just kind of spiraling onto me. It's like everything's just really kind of pressing and impending on me. My mind is running a thousand miles an hour, out of control, like a NASCAR flipping across the racetrack. Anxiety to me feels like I am frozen in place as all of these heavy emotions just fill through my body. My chest feels too big and too small at the same time. I feel like I'll never get out of it ever again. Man. Anxiety feels like I'm trembling and I'm scared. My hands are sweating, my heart is pounding, and I'm super overwhelmed.
Thank you. Now that is what anxiety feels like to me. <laughs> All jagged edges and clashing chords and rhythms crashing forward. Anxiety is something we've all experienced because it's an inextricable part of being human. And tonight we're going to explore the intersection of anxiety and music, the ways in which music can help us express, process, and ease anxiety, and how music can promote the mindfulness that can bring us back to ourselves in our most anxious moments. Well, welcome to Orchestra Hall, everyone. I am Sarah Hicks, and it's my privilege to lead this exploration with, of course, the incredible musicians of the Minnesota Orchestra, but also with some really extraordinary guests who will be illuminating the intersection between music and our mental states. So my first guest is a biomedical engineer and otolaryngologist specializing in auditory neuroscience. In other words, someone who knows a lot about how sound is processed in the brain. Dr. Hubert Lim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, Dr. Lim, tell me a little bit more about auditory neuroscience. How do our brains process sound? Yeah, so at University of Minnesota, my group focuses on how sound is coded in the brain. And with that information, we're able to improve and develop better hearing technologies like hearing aids and cochlear implants. Uh, now, the brain, uh, it is quite complex, no doubt, uh, and sometimes it appears a bit mysterious, uh, but there is some order to it, thank goodness for us, that there is, um, and the way it processes sound can be characterized in different studies. At least for hearing, sound is coded in maps. For example, in the auditory brain, you have cells in a given location that's coding for low frequency tones. And then cells next to that are coding for middle frequency tones. And then next to that is high frequency tones. So you have this orderly spatial organization of cells coding for frequencies like a piano, what we call tonotopy. And there's different maps like that for pitch, for rhythm, for periodicity, and so on. So basically the brain takes that sound, breaks it up into features, and then reorganize it in a way that it can perceive and understand sound. So interesting. So I understand that organized sound, like music, lights a part of the brain that are not about auditory processing. So what does that tell us? That's correct, uh, Sarah, that in the past decade, um, there's been compelling discoveries and growing evidence that sound can actually activate similar brain regions, or some of the same brain regions, that's involved with reward processing and pleasure and emotional responses. Some of those you've heard of, like the amygdala, the basal forebrain, different portions of your frontal cortex. And I think that has been one of the major advances of the neuroscience field for music therapy. Music therapy. So bringing that back into the mental health sphere, because music interacts with so many regions of the brain, how could it be used to impact our emotional states? Yeah, I like to think of it in two ways. Uh, one, all of you are familiar with, is you can use music as a tool to be able to alter your heart rate, change your breathing patterns, cause physiological responses in your body. And these changes can help you calm down, they can help you relax, they can make you feel better, they can reduce your stress. So that, to me, I view as a more indirect way. Now there's a other way, which is you know, more challenging and creative ways to do it, but you directly use music to activate those limbic and uh, emotional regions of your, of your brain. And that will be, of course, some individualization. We all know that we have different preferences for music, what affects us, what moves us, and those will have to be incorporated into it. But there is new research also coming out that you can use complex sounds for treating many individuals, for example, like 40 hertz stimulation. Or in my lab, we've found complex sounds that can treat tinnitus and the associated symptoms related to that. So I think it's an exciting time for the future with all these different uh, methods and opportunities with music therapy. It is exciting. Thank you so much, Dr. Lem, yeah. for joining us. Thank you for us. having me.
And now another perspective. For over 30 years, psychiatrist and social worker Diane Hartman has seen her patients not only grapple with their mental health, but also with the stigma around their struggles. So as also a musician and composer, she has written works that address mental health issues in an effort to promote understanding and empathy. Here is the first movement from her work, The Music of Mental Health, that takes us on a journey from anxiety and struggle to finding healing.
now from a psychiatrist's perspective to a musician's perspective. As performers on stage, we might look like we all have it together all the time, but the truth is, whether or not on or off the stage, we're human too, and we live and work through our own anxiety. We have our own stories, and I'm glad my friends and colleagues, Sonia Mantel and Greg Millerin, are here on stage to share a little bit of theirs. So, Sonia, I know that you've worked through your own performance anxiety. How do you recognize it, and what do you immediately do? So, usually the first thing that happens for me is that I have a lot of racing thoughts. Um, it's usually focused on really, like, small details I normally don't think about in performances, and that usually affects my breathing next. I usually sense that I'm not able to fully inhale, like sometimes I'll be inhaling and then I feel like I just hit this this like point where it just stops. So when I get to that point, um, I realize it's happening and I try to like feel like very grounded with my feet. Like specifically, I try to like feel like, like almost like lower to the ground than usual. And then I'll also try and just exhale as slowly as I possibly can. Um, and then another thing I sometimes do that helps me a lot, I actually look at the posture of other people playing around me. Um, specifically, sometimes shoulders helps me a lot, just seeing like, you know, how low their shoulders are. And yeah, just seeing what energy other people are bringing to the stage, that helps me. Good energy, that makes sense. Greg, what are the sort of long-term strategies you've sort of learned and discovered to manage your anxiety? Yeah, you know, I have noticed over the years that it's not just anxiety that can be an issue for me, but the emotional responses I have to the anxiety um, that can build and feed off each other. Um, I think as a society, we're taught that anxiety is something to be avoided and perhaps feared. And so if I'm also feeling fear and dread in response to the anxiety, that can become, some, become something that's truly unmanageable. So I have learned to simply notice that the anxiety is there, and sometimes I even engage with it. I say, do you need anything from me right now, anxiety? <laughs> and um, I, like Sonia, I also notice things around me. I notice my breathing, I notice the sound of the orchestra, so I'm not only fixated on the anxiety and not internalizing it. And I'll notice that when I do that, the anxiety stays perfectly manageable, and sometimes it'll even fade away on its own. Making friends with anxiety. No, I love that. So, Sonia, what's the one thing you would tell your younger self about anxiety, given your understanding now? I think I would tell my younger self that, you know, it's okay that you're having feelings and sensations like this, and you're definitely not alone. Um, you know, a lot of people struggle with this, and especially musicians. So I would, I would tell myself that. With compassion, yeah. No. How about you, Greg? Yeah, you know, my younger self probably didn't even know to label what he was feeling as anxiety. So I would probably tell him, this is what you're feeling. It's perfectly normal to feel this way. And you shouldn't be afraid of it. And it's OK to talk to other people about what you're feeling. That can be extremely empowering and give you a lot of freedom. Sonia, Greg, thanks so much for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you. When we were putting together this concert, we wanted to include as many voices as possible, and so we reached out to our followers on social media with three questions. What does anxiety feel like to you? What does feeling at peace in your body feel like? And how do you move from feeling anxious to comfort? Their answers have inspired and been integrated into a new commission, a work written by composer Molly Joyce that we premiere tonight. Here is serenity. What does anxiety feel like for you? being twisted in a knot.
What does anxiety feel like? It feels like one is desperately trying to catch up with the rest of the orchestra, frantically scrambling through the previous measure perpetually. It feels like a series of false endings, never ending. It feels like yearning for a blessed return to the opening chord, if only. My anxiety feels buzzy and as if I'm unattached to my surroundings. I feel I'm grounded and I'm moored. When I have anxiety, I am unfocused. What does anxiety feel like? Anxiety is your mouth salivating mercury. The poison comes up from the stomach, out from the lungs, and clouds your vision. It's every worst truth about yourself being exposed and known to everyone near you without saying a word because somehow they already know. And then your head gets dizzy, your eyes water, and your knees buckle. It's knowing the worst is coming and you can't stop it because you did it to yourself. It's a curse you made in your own mind and your body and no amount of logic can cure it. Anxiety for me is like being trapped in a box from which I can't escape. Anxiety feels loud and fast. It feels like everybody is trying to talk to me all at once, but I can't understand what they're saying. Anxiety can take many forms for me. Feelings vary depending on where I am mentally with the situation. Hyperventilation, feeling of despair, like no one is listening or can hear me. Total body sensation, tingling from head to toe to fingertips. Uneasiness, sometimes my body can sense the anxiety even before I can mentally grasp the, situ the situation. A feeling of heaviness, the weight of the world is on my shoulders. Anxiety feels unmoored, scattered, within oneself and breathing quivers. I've experienced this myself from the outside, watching my husband Todd, a former Minnesota Orchestra employee, in the months before his death of glioblastoma multiform terminal form of brain cancer. As the disease progressed and Todd's world got progressively smaller from the kind of mobility and abilities, he moved more within himself and his breathing was erratic. What calmed him and what brought him peace was music. Out of control process that I get swept up in. It's mostly irrational and scary. Anxiety is feeling trapped in a million sharp edges of armor, in the darkness, alone, afraid in the vastness, with no light in sight. I cannot move. And then, beginning with one and then several long, oceanic, deep breaths, the rhythm of the waves embrace me and it brings me back to where I have just enough courage to lift my heavy head and slowly open my eyes. And I see light so far ahead in the distance. It is balance, a horizon line. Anxiety is an evil, invisible, long-toothed rodent gnawing at my insides. Anxiety is uncomfortable, uh, yes, uh, but it is normal, uh, especially when performing um, in any situation that requires effort to be ready and presented to others, such as uh, playing music or any public performance, um, 
so I'm glad you are normalizing it as natural process, not a pathological condition. What does being at peace in your body feel like? When my body is relaxed, my mind feels free. For me, a relaxed body feels melty, like I'm fully engaged in my surroundings and present to the moment. When my body starts to relax, it feels tired at first because it is usually holding so much tension. The release and ease is unfamiliar at first, but feels welcoming. Then, I feel like I can move freely without impediments. Feels like a river flowing. Oh my God, without music, I wouldn't be able to exist. I grew up as a very quiet, modest, introverted baby boomer. I found out later that I had generalized anxiety disorder and a few other close seconds. There is no medication that helps me more than music of all styles. I received two degrees in music education just to stay close to music. When my close and dear spouse wants to go to a concert, I scream, yes, please. warm, grounded. Sometimes when I'm really relaxed, it feels like gravity is working extra hard on me. My connection to the ground and the earth below me is stronger. I recover by taking a walk or riding my bike. Feeling relaxed is floating in the air, lying on my side, serenely observing the beauty of everything below me. I feel like one of the people in a Chagall painting. Relaxation is the deepest inhale through the nose I can possibly take. It's my favorite smells of cooking foods, leather, and perfumes. It's the good kind of dipsy, spinning in an open field with arms wide and hair in the breeze. Sometimes I may not even feel relaxed in my body as I struggle to calm my mind or vice versa. Just one big major exhale a peaceful deep sleep, whatever that feels like. Relaxed? Does that really happen? How do you move from feeling anxious to comfort? Being in nature gives me perspective. I feel grounded, connected, and joyful. Music from my sunshine playlists, which are songs that always bring me joy, and spending time walking and moving in nature are two things that help me move from feeling anxious to feeling at ease, always without fail. The honesty bomb communication. When you learn to communicate when it hurts you, you change everything. Perspective and understanding. The love and care of a partner to communicate these things with clears the way the clouds, cures the poison, and quiets the heart and mind. I move 
move from anxiety to feeling at ease by rhythmic breathing and thinking of my wonderful daughter. Movement helps me to know that within me, I have the power to recover. Deep breathing only stirs up my asthma. Technology only amps up my heart. Therapy, practical experiences, finding something else to occupy that space in my brain, such as going for a walk, playing a board game, cooking food, or something else that I can do with my hands. Knowing someone has listened and helped us on the way, near the fire trucks, ambulance in the distance, a loving animal. Silence and noticing that sounds of nature brings me back to feeling of ease. Closing that computer and knowing that work is done for the day. A drink, a fire in the fireplace, or the crickets of night when some nice slow peaceful music or not. I'm here with musician, artist, producer, manager, man of many hats, Laser Beak, and you're wearing a hat today. I'm wearing a hat. I, yeah, apropos. exactly. <laughs> so, what are you up to lately? Oh man! Tell me about all your projects. All my projects. So, I'm a musician and a producer. That's like my passion. But also, I manage artists. I run a record label, Doomtree Records, and I kind of general manager of that, and I'm always hustling to make ends meet. So it's been a cool 20 years of figuring out all the different things to help supplement being able to still be a musician. Mm -hmm. And so with Doomtree, we started out as just a crew of like-minded friends who were kind of learning how to create music together. And then coming up in Minnesota, there's not a ton of infrastructure. So, oh, there's no label that'll put out our album. I guess we are the label. Mm -hmm. So we start a label and then we figure out how to, how to press CDs back in the day and like, figure out how to book the shows and all that. And every time there was a new thing or a new hurdle, I just was so excited that I would raise my hand and say like, I'll try to figure that out. Then as we're slowly getting more success, you know, there's there's constantly more things that are coming up. And I just kind of bit off more than I could chew. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know what I was experiencing. Like I wasn't sleeping. My body felt like it was on fire. I couldn't focus. I was losing sensation in my limbs. Then I finally went and talked to my doctor and God bless her, she was just like, okay, as humans, like we're good at dealing with a lot of stress. It's actually kind of healthy to have a mm -hmm. decent amount of stress and we can we can handle it. But if it's like a roller coaster, we want to be like right here before the top. And she's like, and you just kind of went here. <laughs> so we got to bring you back over here. Yeah. And I just remember like crying, of course, and yeah. being like, I, I, no one had ever explained it to me. She's like, you're dealing with extreme anxiety. That was like this breakthrough moment. That was about probably seven years ago. When I realized what I was experiencing was not just something insane happening to me, that, that it was a, a, mm -hmm. an experience that every human being has had since the dawn of time at some point or another, it was such a eureka moment of connection for me. Like, 
oh my God, it just, it cleared everything. And that's powerful in itself to know that like, we're all going through this stuff together and, mm -hmm. um, and it's gonna get hard. It gets easier when you talk about it. Our friend Laserbeak so eloquently expresses his experience of moving from anxiety to connection and healing. When we talk about music and healing, though, we're not just talking about the act of listening, but also the act of creating as well. Some musicians strive to shine a light on mental health and actively incorporate it into their art. We're so fortunate tonight to have such an artist share our stage. Singer-songwriter Chastity Brown has long been open about her mental health and expresses her experiences poignantly through her music. She candidly addresses difficult emotions and her journeys towards healing. Tonight, she shares with us two powerful songs, Can't Take You Out and Mosaic. Please welcome Chastity Brown. Take you out my heart. I can't take you out my mind. I know that you're gone by these tears in my eyes. can take you out my heart I can take you out my mind I know that you're gone by these tears in my eyes
When I broke, there were pieces on the ground. There were pieces I had found were shiny. When I broke, it was clapping thunder cloud. It was beautiful somehow, but frightening. I couldn't name the thing that wouldn't let me die. I couldn't name all the colors in the sky. I couldn't name the thing that wouldn't let me die. When I broke, I didn't stop myself, but let everything I felt have wrong to breathe. Cause when I broke, I must have needed it. To see all the parts of me that deserve to live. I couldn't name the thing that wouldn't let me die. I couldn't name all the colors in the sky. I couldn't name
listening to music that moves us can create moments of emotional engagement and relief by capturing and holding our attention fully. But the impact of music can go even further because as we listen to music, we're also exquisitely attuned to each moment as it unfolds. And it, it can help us to be more connected to the present and to ourselves. We're so lucky to have with us Marianne Johnson from the Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing at the University of Minnesota. She'll share with us the powerful ways in which music can help us with mindfulness and wellness. Marianne, welcome. Oh, thanks, Sarah. I'm so happy to be here. So, Marianne, I know that the word mindfulness gets tossed around a lot. What does it really mean? That's such a great question. Well, actually, I like to say that mindfulness is actually an innate capacity that we all have. However, given the busyness of our lives, inevitable life stressors, and of course, states of anxiety that we can all fall into, it can be really difficult to engender this innate capacity. So it can be helpful to build this capacity through mindful meditation and everyday practices like mindful eating or listening to music mindfully. So uh, a simple definition of mindfulness that I'd like to share with you comes from John Kabat-Zinn, who over 40 years ago developed something that some of you may know about, a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. Uh, and it's an eight-week program, now very well researched, um, teaching mindfulness meditation as a well-being and stress reduction method. So here's his definition. Mindfulness is an awareness of one's present moment experience with openness, curiosity, and a non-judgmental attitude. And I want to pause for a minute when I say non-judgmental because that certainly doesn't mean that you lack discernment. But what it does mean is that we offer ourselves an opportunity to befriend that not always so helpful inner voice that we can have. Uh, and that's a process that we develop over time with patience and practice and a great deal of kindness. As we know, this being human isn't always easy for any of us. So um, the other thing I just want to say is that for over 40 years now, research tells us that the regular practice of mindfulness meditation can lead to reduced stress and reduction in symptoms of depression and anxiety. And interestingly, uh, when you look at the reported benefits of mindfulness and then you also look at the benefits of listening to music, you find a great deal of similarity in that research. So that's why together listening to music uh, mindfully uh, can be so, I think, healing for us. So instead of talking about mindfulness, I thought that I would lead us through a short mindfulness meditation exercise. So I hope you're up for that. All right, so um, I'm going to settle into a comfortable seated position, and I'm going to invite you, and I'm going to invite you to do the same if you'd like. You'll notice I'm putting my feet on the floor here. So just taking a moment now to turn that gaze that's so obviously externally oriented for so many of us throughout the day a bit inward now, getting comfortable in the chair that you're sitting in. Your eyes may be opened or closed to this exercise, whichever you prefer. If open, a soft gaze may be helpful. Taking a moment to really notice the feel of the placement of your feet on the ground. Perhaps noting that your body is being held and supported by the chair you're sitting in now. As best you can in this moment, gently inviting ease in the body, softening into any areas of holding, bracing, or tightness. And now, becoming aware of the movement of your breath, your body breathing, as if stepping back a bit to observe. This body knows just how to breathe. So no striving, efforting, or controlling the breath is needed. Just being with the rhythmic quality 
of the body breathing, the in-breath and the out-breath, just as it is. And now when you're ready, allowing your attention on the breath to recede a bit into the background for now, and bringing awareness of sounds to the forefront, Sounds in the hall, close by, further away, a movement of the body, the subtle sounds, the sounds of my voice coming and going. and also receiving the sounds of silence. Not having to chase after sounds, simply receiving them, just as you received the natural breath. And noticing when your attention has moved away from simply hearing a receiving sound perhaps noting the very human tendency of the mind to wander and to judge, editorialize, or critique. This happens to all of us. As best you can, with a sense of openness, curiosity, and kindness, gently acknowledging any thoughts or emotions that may arise without having to judge them in any way or to attach to or proliferate them. Rather, just acknowledging them and seeing them perhaps as clouds in an open expanse of sky being seen and passing through. And then when you're ready, returning to receiving the changing nature of sound and of silence. And now, if you would like, continuing this mindful listening practice on your own as you receive the orchestra's performance that's about to start, coming back to the breath or the feel of your feet on the floor, whenever you feel the need to refresh and renew, and then returning to listening to, receiving the music mindfully, as if allowing the music to simply wash over you. Throughout this piece, please note, I will also quietly offer a few one-word mindful prompts. Aware.
receiving, remembering. Being with. I really would encourage you all now, if you'd like, just to take a moment to notice what it feels like in your body, mind, and heart, having just listened to that piece mindfully, just noticing whatever is present for you. And then before we listen to this next piece, I just want to say that a uh, Minnesota orchestra musician once told me that a mentor of his told him that the music is good enough already. Don't need to add anything to it. And simply allow it to express itself. So 
May you do uh, enjoy the opportunity to listen mindfully now to And the Birds Are Still, simply and mindfully allowing the music to express itself.
Yeah. Wow. So wasn't that just a wasn't that just a beautiful piece of music? Yeah. Yeah. I hope your mindful presence uh, made listening to it even more exquisite, but it was really beautiful. So, Sarah, I'd like to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, or just invite you to give a response to the audience, because last week, I think it was, I asked you why you chose the two specific pieces that you did tonight for us to listen to mindfully. And I just loved your response. So I'm wondering if you could share that with the audience. Sure. When we think about mindfulness in music, I think we often go to stillness or quietness in music. But I feel that it shouldn't be passive. Listening to music, being mindful, those are engaging. We participate. We're active. And so I chose the first piece because it takes us on a journey, and we end up somewhere different from where we started. And this beautiful piece by Yoshimatsu, every section I feel like I'm opening a door and looking into this wonderful new room, and I love that sense of constant rediscovery. Oh, yeah, that's just such a beautiful description of listening to music and, and the pieces that you chose. So thanks so much, and mindfulness. Thanks, Marianne. Yeah, and thank you. It's just been such a wonderful opportunity, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Mm -hmm. As we come to the end of this evening's exploration, I am reminded of the words of John Kabat-Zinn, the founder of Modern Mindfulness, who reminds us that you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. We've all encountered those unstoppable waves, but how they crest, how they break, how we learn to ride them, that is unique to each one of us. And when I face my stormy seas, my personal surfboard has always been music. As an anxious kid and teen, I often found it excruciating to navigate the world. I felt like I didn't belong. I was terrified that I would say or do the wrong thing. But rather than retreat into myself, I always turned to music. For me, then, as it is now, music is a way to channel that stomach-churning, electric sting of anxiety into the sheer energy that can launch me forward into the world, that can move me to joy, because music turns my focus outward. It unfolds me. It propels me towards hope. So... I leave you now with music of exuberance and bright sunshine, music that I turned to as a young person to give me a shot of joy, music that made my feet dance when they wanted to run away. And just as I found my own ways to surf those challenging waves, I know you'll find yours. It may be a wild ride, but I'll see you on the shore. Thank you. 
woke up from a crazy dream last night. You were in my arms, sleeping by my side. You pulled me from a dark, cold place in my mind. This was the only thing to find. You're like the sun, yeah. You're like the sun. 